Hello, I'm Reagan Wascom, director of the Colorado Water Institute at Colorado State University. And in this session, I'll provide a brief overview of agricultural water use in the West. We'll discuss the types of farming and ranching in the interior West. We'll talk about dry land versus irrigated agriculture. Talk a bit about how ag uses water in the West. And then we'll end by talking about why crop production uses so much water and what can be done to reduce agricultural water demand. In the United States, we have approximately 400 million acres of agriculture, crop production, if you will. And the U.S. produces about $200 billion in crop receipts annually and about $200 billion in livestock receipts. Of the 400 million acres in the U.S., about 55 million acres are irrigated. And so we have about 14 percent of total U.S. crop production is irrigated. The interesting thing is, is that that 14 percent produces 40 to 50 percent of all crop receipts in the United States. And so the point is that irrigation provides huge value and sustainability for, to U.S. agricultural productivity, but it's also responsible for about 70 percent of all water consumptively used in the United States. So this first map shows where irrigation occurs in the United States with each blue dot on the map representing 10,000 irrigated acres. And you can see as you look at the map the Ogallala Aquifer states in the middle of the country. You can see the irrigation in the lower Mississippi Valley, particularly Arkansas. And then the Central Valley in California is also easy to, to identify on this map. Now when we look just at the 11 western states, this chart shows agricultural water use for each state in the green bars with the small blue fraction on top representing municipal use. Direct use for livestock watering in the West is a fractional amount, less than 1% of the total. But the fact is that crop production is very water intensive, consuming 80 to 90% of all water used in the Western states. I'll talk more about why this is later. But two interesting points on this slide. One is that the U.S. Geological Survey typically reports water withdrawals, while it's the consumptively used water that really ma matters to water management in the West. And then additionally, it's important to note that water in agriculture is much lower in actual value than the value for industry or municipal supplies. And I think that explains a lot about why water is moving out of agriculture and into other uses in the West. Now, as you can see in this map, the change in irrigated acres that's occurring uh, over the recent period of time, this map shows the change from 2007 to 2012 where each red dot represents a thousand acre decrease in irrigation over the period and each blue dot represents a thousand acres of increased irrigated lands. And what you see when you look at this map is a trend of decrease in the west and increase in the eastern half of the United States. We think this trend is likely to continue on a gradual basis due to several factors. Aquifer declines, transfers to urban industrial uses, as well as temporary and permanent dry up of agricultural lands due to ecological concerns as well as drought. 2012 was a drought year in the West and so you see that reflected in this particular graphic. 2013 was a better year in some states and we saw a rebound. Now when we talk about Western agriculture it's important to note that less than 10 percent of all agricultural lands in the, in the West are irrigated. In Arizona, Montana, New Mexico, and Wyoming, the, the number is less than 5%, while in California and Idaho, about 30% of agricultural acres are irrigated. So much of the West is dry land agriculture, predominantly livestock grazing with some sheep grazing as well, and you can see that in this particular slide. We also have dry land hay and small grains such as wheat and barley, as well as sorghums and millets and other crops like that that are produced under dry land regimes. But for most of the West, high value crops require irrigation. Now hay is the number one crop in a great deal of the West. It's number one in Wyoming and New Mexico and in the top five for all Western states except for the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon, and California to some degree as well. Much of the hay grown in the Western U.S. is flood irrigated as shown in this particular slide from surface irrigated ditches in uh, river valleys such as the one you see here. But a growing number of crop acres are irrigated by sprinklers and drip irrigation, 
You can see in this slide a photo of a sprinkler, uh, center pivot sprinkler on a Colorado potato field. Now producers switch to sprinkler irrigation in most cases to reduce their labor costs as well as to allow them to farm more land. Now when you get down to the southwestern states, particularly Arizona and California, winter vegetable crops are grown on amazingly productive desert soils if you have adequate water. For example, almost all of our winter lettuce is grown in Arizona using Colorado River water. Now this slide shows you the trends in irrigated acres in the United States. And you can see on the whole we've probably peaked at around 55 to 56 million acres, but it's been relatively stable in recent years. The interesting thing you notice on this slide when you compare 2008 to 13 is the decrease in water application rates. Top five state irrigated states in the U.S. are Nebraska, California, Arkansas, Texas, and Idaho. Interestingly, U.S. farmers today use less 15 percent less total water than they did in 1980, yet they produce 70 percent more food. Now this chart explains that to some degree. The green line on this particular chart shows the trend in irrigated acres in the U.S. since 1970 with the units there on the left, whereas the blue line shows the average irrigation application in inch inches per acre. And you can see that gradual decrease in application. Why do you think we're seeing this declining trend? Well, one obvious reason shown in this slide is that we're advancing the adoption of higher efficiency irrigation methods. And you can see here that over 60 percent of irrigation occurs using either sprinkler irrigation or micro irrigation or drip as we sometimes call it. Also remember we're moving irrigation eastward in the United States to more humid regions where irrigation tends to be supplemental and needed mainly to ensure yields during dry periods and droughts. So why don't all irrigators convert to sprinkler or drip systems? Well, the USDA tracks improvements on farms in terms of uh, system efficiencies and they also ask farmers what are the barriers that they're experiencing to adopting innovations and improvements. And among those, probably the predominant ones are they can't finance the improvements or the improvements won't pay for themselves. But we also see that producers in the West say that they're uncertain about the future water availability for their area and thus they're concerned about making those investments. Now I mentioned earlier that crop production is inherently water intensive. So in spite of technology, we are fundamentally limited by the physiology and the biochemistry of photosynthesis. Plants open their stomates in order to fix carbon, but when they do that, water vapor is transpired from the leaf. And you can see in this particular graph that the result of the way that plants capture carbon is that there's a direct relationship between crop yield and evapotranspiration. You can see here I show yield functions for several crops and it's a, it's a straight line, just different slopes depending on the crop. If you restrict water to plants, they close their stomates. If you do this for long enough, you'll see crop yields begin to suffer. Now this graphic shows how the ratio of the E or the evaporative component of ET or evapotranspiration changes as the crop canopy closes as it grows. And you can see that in the photos along the bottom of the slide. When the crop is small, more bare soil is exposed and the E component of ET is relatively larger compared to the total. So one obvious conservation strategy is to reduce the evaporative component of ET through using surface crop residues or other mulches to uh, reduce evaporation. So why are some particular crops more water intensive than others? And this table answers that question to a large degree. And what you see is that the number of days the crop is out in the field growing and the season of the year that a crop grows explains most of the difference between consumptive use and crops. And you can see the range from alfalfa to dry beans here and how the length of growing season has a major impact on water use. Now often irrigation efficiency and, and water conservation are used synonymously. And here's where I think Western and Eastern perspectives begin to clash and really matter. In the West, we have a water rights system based upon quantification of consumptive use and return flow obligations. So water use efficiency 
is the ratio of water applied compared to water consumed by crop ET. Irrigation efficiency may be improved while crop consumptive use largely remains unchanged. So upgrading irrigation systems alone can increase efficiency, but it doesn't necessarily create water that's available for transfer to other uses. So our challenge is not just to increase irrigation efficiency, but also to reduce crop consumptive use. We can reduce crop consumptive use by several methods. By reducing the number of acres irrigated, we can switch to cool season crops, switch to crops with shorter growing seasons. We can practice deficit irrigation, or irrigating less than full ET. And then, as I mentioned earlier, by reducing evaporative losses from the field surface. So there's much that can be done in agricultural water conservation, but there's a tendency to oversimplify the legal, financial, and social constraints to changing water use practices in the West. Fortunately, there are opportunities that can benefit farmers, and right now there's a great deal of effort going into incentivizing conservation for producers through federal and state and local incentive programs. Bottom line is that it takes a lot of water to grow crops. And as pressure mounts on irrigation water in the West, it also affects our food production capacity. Meeting growing global food demand with less water is not going to be easy. And in fact, much of the easy work on this has already been accomplished. Now we have to get on with the hard business of increasing food production with reduced water and greater hydrologic uncertainty. And I think we'll do that through a number of techniques, including new crop varieties, new technologies, and new cropping systems. We'll need to develop ag enterprises that are resilient to uncertain water supplies. In some cases, we'll have to transition from full irrigated fields to dry land or rain-fed agriculture or perhaps limited irrigation regimes. And then finally, we'll need to improve our ag water management institutions, policies, and organizations to facilitate some of those changes. Thanks for, for participating in this online course. If this short discussion about ag water conservation has interested you, you can take a look at our online ag water conservation clearinghouse.